First things first, Natalie, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm excellent. Thank okay, you good. so much for taking the time <laughs> to talk with me. Um, before we get into the album, I'd like to start with the simple things. Um, when did songwriting become, become a must for you? Do you remember? In my life? Yeah. I had a strange beginning as a musician. I had no intention of being a musician. It was kind of happened to me by accident. The first time I wrote a song was I, I was already in a band and I was 16 years old, maybe 17. I met the band when I was 16, but I was part of the band in, when I was 17. And um, so I just, it, it wasn't my passion and it wasn't what I thought my path was. But I had to start writing songs because I was the, the singer in the band <laughs> and the lyricist suddenly. Right. Yeah. When did it become a passion? Or perhaps it never did, but I assume it did. Well, that would have been 1981 when I joined the band. And I think by 1986 when we made In My Tribe, I'd finally learned enough about songwriting that I became passionate about it. And it was really what I wanted to do. Especially that early on, what could you, what could you, how would you phrase this? What could you, I, I wonder, what could you get out of songwriting? And that's a weird way of saying it. But what could you get out of putting thoughts to paper and kind of performing them for people? Well, I'd started taking piano lessons when I was eight. And so I, I knew how to play the piano a bit. And I always felt really calm from playing the piano. I would sit down and maybe I'd be angry or sad or something. <laughs> and it would always soothe me in a way. So, and I loved listening to music. But the lyric writing always seemed very challenging and it still does seem very challenging to me. But I started to really enjoy it um, for in my tribe. Okay. Uh, I'd have to say that's when, and what I got out of it was, at that point I'd been in the band a while and we'd been performing for people. So there was this personal release that I would have, a, you know, emotional release. But then I knew that pretty soon I was going to sing these songs for people and I was going to connect to other people. Mm -hmm. And I remember how thrilling it was when enough people knew my songs that they could sing along. And then there was another step was when my songs were popular enough that other people recorded them. Okay. So there's, an, there's definitely a lot of communication and emotional um, camaraderie that is around music for right. me. And you say writing lyrics was and still at times is challenging. How come? When you're writing lyrics, you, you're working in a space about this big <laughs> because you can't make the song too long and you can't use language that isn't, it could be poetic if you weren't putting it to music, but it can't be, it's not a, a song that's, language that isn't singable just is off the table. Sure. So it's like, you, and then it's nice when there's a refrain, so then that takes out even more possibility of more words, you, you know, if the chorus is going to repeat and be the same three times, it's like a pie graph, then okay, then I don't have to write words for this section. <laughs> um, so it just seems like there's less and less space and the words, um, if you want them to rhyme, then that limits. I mean, I can spend a whole day just trying to find <laughs> one rhyme <Okay. laughs> and drive myself a little bit insane. Um, and songwriting is all about patterns, whether it's harmonic patterns and rhythmic patterns and verbal patterns, um, where you put the accents, you know, where you, which words are you stressing, because that can change the meaning, and, uh, and the rhyming is just mm. torment okay. for me. <laughs> With everything you just mentioned in mind, then, when you, and you've written quite a bit of music uh, over your, the course of your life, I think this is solo album number nine, if I'm not mistaken. So when you started what would become this new album, what is the beginning? Do you have certain ideas in yet? Because I imagine, well, let me phrase it simpler. What motivates you still to write songs and what motivated you to write these songs that ended up on the new album? I think 
think my motivation is still the same, that it's a way to express my emotions. Even if no one ever hears the song, okay. I have the experience with the music. And then there's also this desire to communicate. And it's, that's the way it's been since the beginning. That's you know, 40 years of this. <laughs> and, but I didn't know I was making a record when I okay. started writing these songs. I just felt moved to write songs. And I hadn't written a single song in six years okay. when I started writing this batch of songs. What was the first song that after those six years came to you? I think it was Come On Aphrodite. Okay. Do you remember what compelled you to, to, to kind of get back into writing then? Well, I do remember doing a benefit concert for um, health workers mm. in, in the Bronx. There was a hospital called Montefiore. And they wanted us to do a concert that they filmed. This was still during the lockdown. It was like Christmas. Mm. So March, April, May, June, July, August, September. Yeah, we were still in lockdown. Okay. And Abana Kumsan Davis, who sings two duets with me on this new album, I invited her and we were singing together. We had not only not been in a room with a stranger or a, you know, a person outside of our little family units, we definitely hadn't made any music together. Okay. And everyone was tested and we knew we were safe. And it was just so moving to be able to sing together. And I just went up to her and said, if I write songs for us, will you sing on a record with me? And she said, yes. And that made me go home and write Come on Aphrodite and Big Girls. Okay. And I, I think the, your, the two of your voices work really well together. So is, can you kind of imagine that as you're writing? Did you kind of have, have her in mind as you wrote them? Well, because I had done that concert, and she sang on more songs than I had sung vocals mm. for. Uh, uh, let me do that again because I have to read it. She not only sang on the songs that previously had backing vocals, she was improvising over other songs. And I was just really enjoying the way our, our voices work together. So I definitely, when I wrote Big Girls, she was in my mind and come on Aphrodite and I had her in mind when I was working on Tower of Babel okay. but when she came to the studio I hadn't finished the lyrics so I ended up doing my own backing vocals. <laughs> but you, you mentioned something interesting uh, when you write and let's let's take come on Aphrodite as an example do you start with the words do you start with kind of the musical landscape uh, it's going to sit in? Unless I'm adapting an existing poem it's always music first. Okay so with this album in particular then, did you have any preconceived ideas about what you wanted from these songs or does that kind of become apparent as you're working on them? Well, for this album, I had written everything on piano and did my demos of piano and voice. And normally I would then go to the next step of demoing string parts or whatever. And I decided not this record, I, I want to collaborate. And um, so I would think what kind of instruments do I want and what kind of arranger am I looking for? So definitely the, the songs that I was hearing, the songs that I was hearing big brass sections on, mm. um, I wanted someone who had a background in jazz because I heard big stacks of you know, reed instruments and brass. And um, like Sister Tilly, I heard flute, oboe, and strings. Mm. But when the arranger, when Gabriel Kahane was working on the song, he wrote me and said, can we add some horns? And I had not even thought of horns. Okay. And that was the kind of collaborative input that I was looking for. And I love when the horns come in at the <laughs> end of it. it just lifts everything. It's magic. Yeah, and I even think in, in a song like um, Big Girls, there's, there's that kind of euphoric moment where, where the horns kind of blast out and then the, those kind of moments are sprinkled throughout the album. So, mm -hmm. so in terms of the musical setting, it, it, and there's a lot of strings on there that I wrote down, uh, a couple of songs have, um, I can't remember which one this was, 
There's a lot of oboe on this record, which well, is not very common on yeah. pop music. I was, I was, uh, though I don't think of myself as a pop musician. I think of myself as a singer-songwriter. And I think that my songs probably have more in common with songs in musicals or um, art songs, traditional art songs, or even traditional folk songs. But I think they have a lot less in common with rock music or mm. pop music. Well, you mentioned folk songs, and that's something I kind of picked up on as well. And maybe this is just uh, my upbringing in music. I, I used to, uh, I have uh, an Irish family background, so we used to listen, listen to a lot of Irish folk. And a song like Eye of the Storm with the flute, and it had kind of, the, for me, at least, that folky. Yeah, exactly. So it has that folky, folky feeling. I think one of the techniques that I like to use in production is... I'm illustrating these songs with music, these words with music. And when I hear the Celtic combination of the fiddle, the flute, mm. and the pipes, I always feel like I'm on the bridge of a ship. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm plying the waters out in the open ocean. I don't know, there's something. And, and usually I'm like approaching the shore of Ireland and it's all green and there's cliffs and everything. But that, that combination of instruments it's really visceral, this, right. the, the images that I get in my head. And I wrote this song all about um, all these metaphors with the sea and, and shipwrecks and all those sorts of things. So it seemed like the perfect um, thing to, to invite Lunasa. And I've known those guys in Lunasa since I think I met them when my daughter was two. So that's 18 years ago. <laughs> And they, they sang on, uh, I sang on the record costs that came out a few years ago before the pandemic, and they played four songs on Leave Your Sleep. Mm -hmm. So we're really good friends, and I just, I got to tour Ireland with them okay. in 2018, and that was, <laughs> that was a dreams do come true. You know, I'm in Ireland with an Irish band, and they played Motherland, okay. and people said, oh, she's doing one of Christie's songs, <laughs> because Christy Moore recorded it. In Ireland, a lot of people think he wrote that, and I just cover his song. <laughs> but you mentioned Ireland, and there's a song, um, which is, the, I think, the only cover that you do on the album. Oh, uh, by Lancome. Uh, Hunting the Wren. Uh, I think the, the words were written by Ian Lynch, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. so, so that connection with Ireland and, and those folk tales, that, that's, that's kind of what I felt when I listened to the album as well. What, what stood out to you about this story? Because this is, I think, about the Wrens of, of uh, Cura. Of I heard Hunting the Wren in 2000, beginning of 2019, and I was just really drawn in by this song. And I thought it was a traditional song that Lancome had recorded, because they do a mixture of original and traditional. Mm. It's just the language that Ian Lynch, the, the songwriter, the language that he used was very simple, stark, and the subject matter was of something that happened in the 19th century. It was the group of Irish women who lived in a community sort of set apart from society on the outskirts of a barracks, mm -hmm. a British barracks called the Kura. But it's also the name of the plain that um, they lived in shelters that they built, which were just essentially holes in the ground covered with sticks and rags because the local authorities wouldn't allow them to build permanent structures. And uh, if they went into the village to get food, they'd be spat on and beaten and whipped. Mm. The people in the village all assumed they were all prostitutes, but they weren't. Some of them were prostitutes, but many of them were common law wives of the soldiers, but they weren't allowed to live on the barracks. Some of them, the, their families had died in the famine, right. and it was workhouse or join this group of women. And uh, the workhouse was, was just brutal, you know. The conditions that they were living under, the possibility you would get a, a contagious disease that would kill you, or you'd basically die of malnutrition, or be worked to death. Mm -hmm. So they, there's a line in the song, she chose the wide open plain or the dark, over the dark workhouse door. And... Uh, I know, he's a phenomenal songwriter. They have a new album that just okay. came out this past, this week, I think. 
Yeah, I wrote down the, uh, the line, despite and the fury are the pe are, um, people re uh, revealed. Yeah. I, I really like despite that phrase. And by fury. There's also the line, um, they flock around the soldiers with their jackets so red for barrack room favors, soldier, um, pennies and bread. Mm. I'll say that again because it's worth it. <laughs> they flock around the soldiers in jackets so red for barrack room favors, pennies and bread. Mm. So simple, but it's really stark and powerful use of language that the lyrics of that song could stand as a piece of poetry alone. Sure. And what I like about your music, and I don't know what your inter interpretation of it is, but I wouldn't call it protest music in, in any way, but you kind of paint pictures of these situations of lives and, and things that have been and kind of reveal in a way, okay, this is how some people are living and look at, look at these, these horrible conditions these or something. circumstances. Yeah, I think a lot of people over the years have mislabeled me as a political songwriter because mm. I always thought of myself as someone making social commentary. Right. Just describing the conditions that people live and often I'm examining power structures, whether it's interpersonal power structures or even in 10,000 Maniacs when I wrote a song like Poison in the Well, I was talking about the disregard that corporations have for the environment and the well-being of the people who have to live around these really dangerous, especially chemical works. Mm. So rather than write a song that is very didactic and kind of mm. like, oh, the companies don't care about the people and people's rights. I decided to write about a family who just turn on their tap and there's no water. And when they investigate, they ask why, what's happened to our water? They're told that there's been a spill of some sort, there's been contamination, but everything's under control. And we see it happening all the time now. Um, I grew up near Niagara Falls, not far, sure. 60 miles away. And uh, there, was a, a whole town built on top of a chemical dump. And suddenly there was an unusual amount of stillbirths mm. or women unable to conceive children and then childhood leukemia. And it came out that this Hooker Chemicals was the name of the company had been bearing dioxin and then went out, of, you know, just sort of left the area, but, you know, buried it all, covered it all up. And then they built a school on top of it. <laughs> You know, the epicenter of the dump, they built the public school on top of it. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and now there's like municipality after municipality is finding out that their water is contaminated. As a songwriter, is it important for you? Well, why is it important for you to illuminate these stories? Well, they're the sort of things that make me think and feel the deepest. Mm. And... I care about people and I care about our communities and I have a platform, people are listening and I've always been attracted to songs that had meaning and messages and, and so I'm not the only one. And so I feel an obligation but it's not like I feel I've signed a contract with society or anything, it's just like I'm compelled to do sure. it. And this album, I stepped a little further back from the, so, the broad scale social commentary for most of it. Right. If you listen to um, Tower of Babel, I, I haven't totally stepped away from it from this album, sure. but I wanted to talk more about love and all the different ways that we, our lives are enriched by love and also the ways people are damaged and hurt by love. Sure. And the album starts with this invocation to the goddess of love with come on Aphrodite. And then there's this whole journey and sometimes there's ecstatic joy comes from love and different forms of love, familial love, um, sisterly love, sure. platonic love and romantic love. And in the case of hunting the wren, a kind of loveless love. You know, if you're paying for a prostitute, there's, right. you know, it's a different kind of love, but passion and, you know, that. But it, it all ends with the Feast of St. Valentine, which imagines this, one of the journalists today I spoke to said, it's a salvation army. And I said, yes, it's an army of salvation for people who've been wounded in love. 
And at the end, I say, keep your courage, keep your faith. You know, love will guide you. And, and at the end, love will conquer all. It's like love will win. And that can either be interpreted as love will, you'll have to surrender to love or um, be dominated by love or saved by love. There are different ways that that final statement on the album can be <laughs> interpreted and the music just goes love will conquer all <laughs> doesn't sound like it's such a great thing that love <laughs> conquers all <laughs> well it, it is such an interesting concept right love it's it, as you mentioned there's so many interpretations and there's obsessive love there's this oh, violent yeah. love and all that self-love yeah i wrote a song about Narcissus and Echo. Yeah. There's even a man who dies of self-love. <laughs> you know, I tried to cover love from as many different perspectives as I possibly could. Did you kind of explain the, the title where the uh, Keep the Courage, uh, the, the title comes from? So I, I, I have one last question and what is your affinity with uh, Greek mythology? Because I'm somewhat into Greek mm -hmm. mythology as well and, and there's a couple of references obviously. In Greek mythology, I feel like everything's happening on a metaphoric level, symbolic level. And you, I love the fact that these gods and goddesses have these supernatural powers, but they're still flawed in so many ways. Right. And, and it seems like when a god or goddess experiences jealousy or whatever, they don't just spite you, they destroy yeah. you. <laughs> it's like... They act out these human dramas on this like this massive scale, and um, I love the fact that they were written by people thousand over a thousand two thousand years ago, and we still experience so many of the same emotions. I like the the continuity and connection to them, and I love that they have these powers to, um, you know. A god can impregnate you with a shower of <laughs> golden coins. You know, I love any kind of folklore or mythology. Natalie, may I thank you for your time? My pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so much.